Alexei uh, came from Russia and uh, he, he came with uh, very great skills in applied mathematics and physics with, despite those skills, he also uh, had, I think, a great intuitive sense of you know, what the equations he was playing with meant and what the, what the physics meant. And he had a, he had a very successful uh, career here as a graduate student, uh, working on a variety of problems from quite large scale nonlinear wave processes down to uh, the smaller scale processes that occur at the ocean surface. And these are the, these are the gravity capillary waves uh, that Cox and Monk uh, were looking at back in the 50s, and Chip, Chip Cox did uh, work in the lab uh, on this, uh, and Michael Longett Higgins helped explain what was going on uh, with these, with these uh, parasitic capillary waves. And after, it, it, it was quite interesting, in, in, in Alexei's um, qualifying exam for the PhD where you have to stand, where you have to present a proposal uh, to your committee. Uh, John Miles was on the committee and after Alexei had presented his proposal and left the room, uh, John, who had a lot of experience with UC's rules uh, since he had served at UC for, with the, with the exception of three years in the Australian uh, National University in Canberra, had served all his career at UC. And uh, John raised the question, do you think Alexei's done enough already? <laughs> um, so, uh, it, it, was, it was truly a delight uh, working, with, working with Alexei. He is, when he left uh, Scripps, uh, he did uh, postdoc at Princeton and uh, then moved on to Yale, where he's now a professor. So I uh, very much look forward to uh, Lexi's talk. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, and uh, despite what Ken said, I'm not going to talk about equations today. Uh, and I will be talking about very different stuff. Uh, what I've been working uh, lately on problems large scale ocean circulation, basically. But before that, a few comments. So I, you saw this uh, photo <laughs> already, and I, I'm, I'm really proud because, uh, first of all, I can show this photo to everyone and say I'm you're not just a modeler, I'm a physical oceanographer. <laughs> uh, I honestly don't remember what this thing was measuring. I have bubbles or turbulence or waves. But it looks cool, I think. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I was really grateful that Ken uh, took me to this uh, cruise my first year as a graduate student. And, uh, I think I gained some five or six pounds over a two week period on the ship. But besides that, it was a really great experience. <laughs> so this is 1992. Uh, and as Ken uh, said, um, I worked on um, gravity capillary waves. And another thing I'm proud of, 2015, we finished another paper with Ken uh, on gravity capillary waves. And I think uh, this, uh, in part, it's uh, a follow up on my uh, PhD thesis, uh, in part, it's some ideas that uh, Ken and I developed. Uh, trying to use this theory of nonlinear gravity capillary waves uh, to explain, uh, uh, to, to describe the balance between uh, input of uh, energy from winds and dissipation. And in particular, one of the results of this paper is that uh, at uh, wave scales, wavelengths of uh, 10 to centimeters to 1 meter, uh, this parasitic capillaries. Uh, can work as a main uh, mechanism for dissipation of this um, energy. And, and one thing that uh, Ken may not remember, or may remember, I don't know, we still have one unfinished paper <laughs> <laughs> with this uh, sort of uh, <coughs> fundamental title, study of steady rotation of surface waves. Rotational uh, is opposite to irrotational potential waves. 
And these are the equations, the only equations I'm going to show today. Uh, and the idea was to describe steady waves on the shear flow in some uh, fundamental ways. The paper is half finished, half unfinished, maybe in 10 years we <laughs> have the final version. All right, so going back to the topic of my uh, talk today, uh, I'm going to talk about the Pacific Meridional Returning Circulation in Past Warm Climates, and it's a collaboration with uh, uh, my uh, former postdoc Natalie Burroughs and several geochemists from uh, Princeton and uh, uh, ETH, Jeff Hogg, for uh, example. <coughs> uh, we have uh, one paper published already and one paper submitted. And uh, uh, I think this is an important topic. Uh, uh, so uh, even, though more, even though many people in this room work on very different, uh, in very, very different field, but I think it's still uh, of interest for uh, physical oceanography in general. This is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll discuss ocean conventional and uh, double convey belts. Describe the Pliocene climate, uh, what climate in my mind, the Pliocene is one of the examples. And then I'll show observational evidence and numerical evidence for uh, the PMOG during the Pliocene. So, this is the problem. Uh, this very schematic picture of the ocean conveyor belt, the details may be wrong, but the main theme is large-scale ocean of the turning circulation is dominated by the Atlantic, by the Atlantic meridional of the turning circulation. Uh, the connection happens through the Southern Ocean, sinking the curves uh, in the Northern Atlantic, uh, in high latitudes of the Northern Atlantic. And with different modification, but this is the paradigm of uh, Northern <coughs> Mediterranean circulation with this uh, AMOX, sorry, uh, with this uh, circulation uh, in the Atlantic, uh, typically shown as this overturning steam function. So, and in this respect, many people ask a simple question, why the AMOC, not PMOC? Why the formation of deep water occurs in the Atlantic, not in the Pacific, and under which conditions it can switch from the Atlantic to the Pacific? Uh, the simple answer why there is no uh, sinking in the North uh, Pacific comes from this figure, showing sea surface temperatures and surface salinity uh, in the Pacific and the Atlantic. And if you look at temperatures, temperatures are more or less similar in the two oceans uh, in the regions of high latitudes. And maybe you can say, well, the Atlantic may be a little bit colder, but the difference is not huge. The difference come, the large difference comes from surface salinity. And there is a huge difference uh, in salinity fields in the North Pacific and in the North Atlantic. Uh, it's roughly two to three salinity units, depending how you measure the difference. And this relatively fresh water or freshwater Pacific color climb <coughs> prevents sinking. Uh, even in coldest winters, uh, it's sufficiently, the ocean is sufficiently stratified uh, to prevent sinking in the Pacific. Uh, in the Atlantic, uh, Subtropical salt saline waters are adapted by the Gulf Stream to high latitudes, and the density is just right for deep water formation to occur. So, the question we asked well, this is a single conveyor belt, a single cell conveyor belt. Is it possible really to have a double conveyor, something like this, with two overturning cells, one in the Atlantic and one in the Pacific? Uh, it would mean a significant re reorganization of the ocean circulation, ocean meridional circulation, a very different structure of uh, water masses, uh, especially in the Pacific, uh, different uh, heat water, uh, heat, uh, forward heat transport, uh, different uh, distribution of nutrients in the ocean. And while theoretically it's an important problem, you want to have some observational evidence that it's possible in the ocean. Uh, 
And for that, we explored Pliocene climate. Uh, Pliocene climate is interesting in the, the sense that uh, continental configurations were very similar to today, uh, but CO2 levels were uh, also elevated and perhaps maybe slightly higher, maybe the same level as today, something like 400 to 500 ppm. This is an example of uh, the compilation of different CO2 measurements, and zero is the present, the Pliocene is 3 to 5 million years ago. And you can see a warming uh, 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 trend with high CO2 in the Pliocene. There is a huge uncertainty. Anything with paleoclimates, there is huge uncertainty. But overall, we can see the trend towards the past. So 400 ppm, it's the level of CO2 in the atmosphere in 2015. And it's close to that, uh, give or take. Uh, and so it was a warm climate. Uh, to give you an example of how warm it was, I can show you just this uh, photo. And this is from uh, Elsmere Island. Uh, it's well within the Arctic Circle. Uh, and today it's a barren land. Uh, there's nothing, virtually nothing growing. Uh, it's cold. There is a continental glacier nearby. But what you can find here, you can find uh, tree trunks. Uh, this is an example of this, uh, such a tree trunk. This is large. Uh, such trees now grow somewhere in Connecticut, uh, New Jersey. Uh, and this is uh, 78 degrees north. So there are plenty of these trees, and you can find uh, fossilized leaves. Uh, they are about 5 million years old. These are the leaves you could find maybe in your backyard uh, if you are living in the East Coast. Uh, but these are very old preserved leaves. So it was much warmer. It was much warmer. And actually, using the tree trunks, you can reconstruct temperatures. And you would need temperatures roughly 20 degrees warmer in any <coughs> mean uh, to support this vegetation, these trees, uh, these leaves, and so on. So uh, temperatures of 18 degrees warmer in these high latitudes. Uh, it's still below freezing in winter, but still it's much, much warmer climate. So I've been working on the problem of the Pliocene on and off for a while, and what we managed to do is managed to reconstruct, with, uh, in collaboration with geochemists, we managed to reconstruct changes in meridional and zonal temperature gradients uh, in the Pacific, uh, and in particular, what we find we find reduced contrast in temperature during that time. Uh, you can actually look at different uh, sites, uh, marine sites, they have proxy temperature records. And what you can do, you can take all these proxy records, and again, zero is present three to uh, five million years ago, it's the Pliocene. You can reconstruct all these uh, records, you can put them together for mid-latitudes, uh, for different parts of the Pacific, for example, mid-latitudes, Eastern Equatorial Pacific, Western Pacific, Wampum, and so on. And in most of these regions, the temperature, you can see the, the increase in temperature. For example, in mid-latitudes, it's almost 6 degrees warmer. And that's going back to this plot. See, in this region, it was about 6 degrees warmer. Uh. And so you can uh, combine all these sites, you can calculate temperature gradients, and this is done in the plot below. Uh, these are changes in uh, uh, oceanic, meridional, and zonal temperature gradient over this time frame. It's about 4 degrees C reduction in the gradient. So the contrast in temperature were about 4 degrees uh, uh, weaker than in the present climate. <coughs> What I need from here is a simple idea that the meridional temperature gradient was reduced. So uh, it was a climate with a reduced equator to pole temperature gradient. Uh, four degrees, if you are measuring from here to here, uh, almost 10 degrees if you are measuring 
to high latitudes. So let me go back to the PMOC and show you some observation of evidence for the PMOC during the Pliocene period of time. Uh, obviously, I don't show you, I cannot show you observational stream function, but I can show you several uh, different proxies from some of the sites here, and I will, uh, I will focus on site 802, uh, which is a site near the Bering Sea uh, in the North Pacific. Just to give you a perspective, this is again, this is the Pliocene, uh, and these are ice raft and debris indicating the emergence of uh, modern glacial cycles. So icebergs started appearing here. So this is the effect of uh, icebergs bringing dust and uh, sediments to the site. Uh, so before that, there were no icebergs or very few of them. And so there are two, two uh, time series I want to show. And it's obviously a conjecture just using two time series to conclude that there was a PMOC a deep, or deep water formation during this time. But they're quite impressive, actually. So one of the time series is by Jenny Coppel. It's basically silica produced by uh, algae uh, in the surface layer. Uh, and there is a strong uh, almost one order of magnitude increase in silica during the Pliocene. Uh, what it indicates, when you have strong stratification, uh, silica is consumed very quickly. So there is no, not more uh, production of uh, silica for the sediments. However, if your mixing layer is getting deeper, you bring more silica, uh, and you can have an increase in uh, opal in the sediments. So an increase of this, uh, an order of magnitude increase can, uh, is indicative of vertical mixing. So bringing more uh, nutrients to the surface. And then there is another side, uh, so the same side but another proxy. It's accumulation rates of uh, calcium CO3. So it's uh, calcium carbonate. And it's indeed with the sediments. So if you know a bit of chemistry of the Pacific, the Pacific Ocean is very corrosive. So whatever is produced, all the shells they produce uh, produced at the surface, uh, when they sink to the bottom, uh, not all of them, but a big fraction are dissolved simply. Uh, an increase of calcium CO3, uh, we interpret here very simply that you had deep, deep convection. This uh, shells were delivered to the bottom very quickly, so they could not, they could survive this uh, effect of seawater and preserved in the sediments. You need these two pieces of evidence because one indicates uh, uh, nutrients brought to the surface; the other indicates uh, a flow of. Uh, biogenic matter to the bottom. Uh, together, they, uh, indicate, they show a bidirectional exchange between the surface of the bottom <coughs> and the ocean. And that's an indication of uh, deep convection, deep water formation. Uh, if you look at these values of calcium carbonate in the sediment for part of the Pliocene, uh, the level is comparable to modern Atlantic level. Uh, and uh, this is just one, you, you, and this is a really huge increase. Uh, again, one order of magnitude increase of accumulation of uh, calcium CO3. Uh, and, uh, there are certain caveats here, but overall, it's suggestive, uh, this two time series suggestive of uh, deep water formation for the Pleistine. Uh, and at least as uh, strong uh, as. Uh, in the modern climate uh, in the Atlantic. So we conducted a series of numerical simulations uh, trying to reproduce this place in climate. Uh, with, uh, and our purpose was, let's forget about all details, uh, continental geometry, 
so vegetation. Let's try to simulate this reduced meridional temperature gradient. That's our key goal. The climate with a reduced uh, equator to pole uh, temperature gradient. <coughs> and we did several, uh, actually 30 experiments with several different couple of models, climate models, global models, uh, uh, using two simple forces. One is CO2 increase, perhaps unrealistic, doubling, quadrupling, and so on. And another one, changing cloud albedo in the extratropics. Uh, reducing cloud albedo in the extratropics allows more sunlight to reach higher latitudes, raising temperature there, reducing temperature gradients. Uh, some combination of the two, we believe, was working during the Pliocene. And we did experiments lasting for anything from 200 to 3,000 years long. Some 30,000 years of uh, numerical experiments. Uh, and they are combined here. For our purposes, we uh, combine the results into <coughs> the, uh, meridional temperature gradient produced and zonal temperature gradient in the Pacific. Uh, I'm interested just in the meridional. Uh, right, so uh, this is uh, on this plot. This is our pre industrial climate, our control climate. The observations are somewhere here. So the modern climate is somewhat here. You can pick any of these uh, uh, points, and this is your modern climate. This is your meridional temperature gradient. Now you can pick up other climates with a reducing meridional temperature gradient and we call it the Pliocene or Pliocene-like climate. Uh, this is this reduction of about 4 degrees of meridional temperature gradient between the pre-industrial and the Pliocene. And so now we can pick up any of these climates and investigate different uh, properties of the ocean circulation from, circula from ocean general circulation to distribution of nutrients or whatever you uh, really, really uh, interested in. So, this is sea surface temperature map. Just checking time. Uh, this is sea surface temperature map uh, of one of those experiments. Uh, this is our control, and this is the warm climate of the Pliocene. You see much warmer temperatures, the reduction of the general temperature gradient. And this is a uh, difference. So, uh, we compared actually the difference with actual observations. Uh, or proxy observations, and we're doing quite well. Uh, the warming in high latitudes is comparable to what's predicted by those observations. What you can notice here, the Pacific, the North Pacific, is getting warmer. And that's actually uh, not uh, favorable for deep water formation there. And I will return to that point later. So the AMOX, this is uh, the AMOX, uh, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation in our pre-industrial climate, and this is the Pliocene. This is after 3,000 years of uh, calculation, so presumably the ocean is in equilibrium by now. So there is this weakening of the uh, circulation, meridional overturning circulation in the Atlantic, but importantly it's still there. It hasn't, gone, uh, hasn't disappeared. Uh, it's a little bit weaker, but uh, it's active, it's still producing deep water in the North Atlantic. One thing for, uh, of interest, the time scales here. So this is our regional AMOC. Uh, this is 3,000 years of simulations. There is a storm reduction first of AMOC, then it's, uh, it recovered. Uh, and if we started with 18 sphere groups, at the end, we have about 10. Uh, these are the adjustments of deep ocean and the upper ocean. Uh, so only after perhaps 2,000 years, it's a long time scale, we can say that the system is uh, equilibrated. And then at the same time, this is what's happening in the Pacific. So this is the strength of the meridional overturning in the Pacific. Uh, this, uh, this strength of a stream function. For 800 years, we saw nothing. Uh, and uh, we were actually very surprised when suddenly uh, there was a st 
strong increase in PMOC. And by the end of a simulation, by the end of a simulation, we have about 16 sphere groups of vegetarian in the Pacific. So, there is an active PMOC uh, in our stimulations. Uh, this is a map of PMOC for pre-industrial climate. There is no significant meridional or veterinary circulation. There is wind-driven circulation in the upper ocean, wind-driven cells. Uh, they are quite pronounced. This is what you expect. Uh, there is some formation of uh, Pacific, North Pacific intermediate water, but it's pretty weak. And the ocean is dominated in the modern climate by water supplied from the southern ocean, circumpolar deep water, and then converted to Pacific deep water. Going to the Pliocene, the situation is quite different. There is an active cell. This is a Pacific meridional returning circulation, similar to what we have in the Atlantic. Uh, again, about 16 smear groups, a formation of North Pacific deep water, uh, and only below there is still, still this uh, cell associated with the Southern Ocean and conversion of uh, certain polar deep water in, into Pacific deep water. You can look at this uh, from a point of view of ocean salinity, and again, in the modern climate, the ocean properties are dominated by processes in the Southern Ocean. There is uh, intermediate water, there is circumpolar deep water and Pacific deep water. And there is just a small ton of North Pacific intermediate water, relatively fresh. Uh, and this is a specific uh, high line, this very fresh water controlling stratification there. When you go to this, our Pliocene simulation, uh, there is this ton of the Pacific and North Pacific deep water. The color line is much reduced. Uh, and this is deep water formation in the north. Uh, one thing I need to emphasize, if you know the uh, water, if you know, uh, water properties in the Atlantic, uh, the deep water formation in the Atlantic is characterized by relatively saline water. But this deep water formation still have a, I'm not sure why, it's a period of the time, okay. Uh, but this water is relatively fresh. But nevertheless, it's deep water. Uh, it reaches about 3,500 meters depth. Uh, and especially in the northern high latitudes, uh, it's sufficiently to uh, alter the properties of uh, sediments in that region where we, where I showed you uh, the observations. Uh, a little bit more of the evidence for uh, deep water formation. This is mixed layer depth, ocean mixed la uh, layer depth for our pre-industrial control climate. Uh, and it's a couple of models, so it has some problems where it formed deep water in the Atlantic, but clearly there is deep water forming in the Atlantic. There's this deepening of the mixed layer seen uh, here. Uh, in the Pacific, well, there's uh, not much deepening of the mixed layer, so there's no deep water formation. However, in our Pliocene simulation, uh, the entire North Pacific become a site, well, not the entire, but a big part of North Pacific become a, a part of deep convection where you can see uh, this deepening of the mixed layer. Uh, by chance or by luck, uh, uh, the site which I showed you before is actually in the center of this deepening of the mixed layer in the model, uh, which as a model, I always like to see some, uh, even accidental coincidence, but uh, this was very encouraging when we saw this. So our interpretation of the data, because is correct, and this is indeed deep water formation and the Pacific meridional of the turning circulation. So you can look at changes in uh, uh, ocean ventilation ages. And the Pacific uh, is known for very old waters uh, because of very sluggish circulation. The age of Pacific waters can be anything from, deep Pacific waters can be anything from uh, 1,000 to 2,000 years. Uh, these are changes uh, uh, between the Pliocene and our pre-industrial control. So you see that 
at least especially in the western part of the Pacific, as well. Uh, but uh, most of the sea is along the western part of the basin and then it's spread along the uh, basin. Finally, uh, people who have been studying uh, this problem of deep western boundary current uh, and uh, uh, part of the Atlantic Meridional Veterinary Circulation is, is, uh, includes this uh, deep western boundary current that uh, takes water from uh, sub uh, subduction regions of two, uh, that takes water forward, uh, sorry, equa equa towards the equator from the subduction regions. So now we have a deep western boundary current uh, in our pl uh, Pliocene uh, climate. And you can see this, this is a change again between Pliocene and control. This is this deep uh, western boundary current. Uh, our uh, uh, subduction sites are here. So it's exactly how this water is now uh, moved uh, along uh, uh, southward. Uh, and this is another explanation why changes in ventilation age are especially pronounced along the western coast and not as much along the eastern coast. There is one fundamental difference between the Pacific and the Atlantic. The Pacific is very broad, the Atlantic is very narrow. So while when you're plotting an overturning stream function, uh, it's a, a nice view, in reality it's a complicated three-dimensional structure and a large part of it occurs along the western boundary. And so it's important uh, to look at these changes. So finally, I want to return to the question, why do we have uh, this activation of PMOC in the Pliocene climate? And as I said before, it's somewhat counterintuitive. It's a warm climate. Uh, there is a warming in the uh, uh, North Pacific. So it would prevent sinking. But if you're thinking in terms of temperature, uh, you are doing uh, you are not correct. You, ha you have to think about salinity. And this is the change in salinity uh, for our Pliocene <coughs> simulation, for our warm climate simulation. What you can see here, a significant increase in salinity uh, in uh, the northern Pacific. Uh, we are talking about uh, one to two, even two and a half PSU changes in this region. Uh, and that's actually quite enough to overcome this uh, temperature increase and make uh, waters less buoyant and sink all, all of that region. You can actually look at uh, structure, uh, latitudinal depth structure of uh, salinity field, and it's actually this is different. Uh, and this is our Pacific Ocean salinity change for the Pliocene. <coughs> you can see this uh, waters upper ocean waters get much more saline, two salinity units roughly. Um, and that means, uh, while well, this is getting fresher. So this haloclime, which I emphasized before, is eroded in our, in our warm climate simulation. And that's uh, enough to invigorate deep water convection. Uh, and it actually uh, happens in a broad region, but the maximum happens uh, uh, along the western part of the uh, basin. So, the last question, well, we have uh, this increase in salinity. Why would we have increase in salinity in warm climate? That's something to address. And this is largely the effect of uh, precipitation. Uh, this is precipitation minus evaporation. Uh, and this is again a difference placing my industrial control. What you can see here is significant reduction of precipitation and increase in evaporation in the North Pacific. And why it happens? Well, this climate has a reduced meridional temperature gradient. A reduced meridional temperature gradient implies weaker uh, atmospheric circulation, uh, a weaker Hadley cell, and generally weaker transport by, of moisture, either by mean circulation or by eddies, synoptic storms. And that leads to a reduction of precipitation in this region, and at the same time, because it's warmer, you get an increase in evaporation. The two factors 
uh, less precipitation, increased evaporation are sufficiently to move the system to the regime where you have uh, much more saline North Pacific and no Pacific uh, fresh water halocline. So the last thing I want to mention is uh, what the effect this has on uh, climate in general and in particular in the, uh, on the energy transport uh, uh, by the uh, ocean atmosphere system. And here I give you a comparison between uh, the Pliocene red line and, uh, so the, sorry, the red line is pre-industrial control and the Pliocene is the black line. So there is a dramatic change now. In a modern climate, forward heat transport or energy transport is more or less symmetric if you are considering both the ocean and the atmosphere. Uh, and you can see it here, this red line. It's with some details, it's more or less symmetric. When we produce this Pliocene climate, the heat transport is largely uh, full or northward. And if there is an increase in this heat transport uh, in the northern hemisphere. So, uh, in part, it, uh, it is a result of this uh, PMOC uh, activation. Obviously, you had just one AMOC. Now, AMOC and PMOC together transport much more heat. Uh, on the other hand, there is a positive feedback here. Uh, you bring more heat to the North Pacific, uh, ocean gets warmer, and that uh, maintains this mechanism. Uh, warmer means more saline, uh, and that contributes to uh, deep water formation. There are various issues related to the petitioning of the ocean heat transport versus atmospheric heat transport, uh, and uh, I'm probably going to talk about it. Uh, but there are quite a few important uh, issues uh, in terms of uh, circulation, uh, how, uh, and also variability. Uh, what we find also that uh, the specific region of returning circulation, uh, while active, is close <coughs> to a threshold. So in some of the simulations, we see it disappearing and appearing again over uh, very over hundreds of years. So uh, this threshold behavior is very important if you are thinking in terms of uh, future global warming. Uh, we are obviously not suggesting, we don't have any evidence for that, that in future global warming uh, there will be a PMOC, but uh, this threshold behavior uh, is something to investigate. So that brings me to summary. And the summary is pretty short. Uh, observational data in numerical simulations suggest that uh, there was uh, a double conveyor belt during this wall pliocene climate. Both PMOC and AMOC were active. And the activation of PMOC in our simulations is related to a very simple mechanism. It's erosion, erosion of the North Pacific holocline uh, due to a weaker hydrological cycle uh, and reduced precipitation associated with a reduced equator to pole, uh, equator to pole uh, temperature gradient. So uh, I'll finish at that. Uh, I hope uh, it's obviously not gravity capital waves. It's <laughs> much larger scale, but if, I think it's uh, my interest. Thank you. The fact that Alexia has been able to do work over such, <laughs> such a range of scales is uh, a testament to his, to his skills. Uh, I think we have a, a couple of minutes if there are any, if there are, are any questions. Yeah. So in the current climate, most people I think would agree that uh, the, um, there's a cap on the maximum transport that the global overturning has, which is determined by a combination of the winds in the Southern Ocean, the wind starts the Southern Ocean and mixing. Um, now, I'm not sure if the, that was reduced. W were those reduced? At least, for example, the winds in the Southern Ocean, you're thinking of, you know, warmer climate with reduced gradients, they would be reduced.
produced. Well, there is some reduction in the and weight. So that the total transfer of the combined AMOC and HEMOC should also go down, which is kind of an at odd with the your result on the heat transfer. Have you looked at that? Um, one thing, uh, what we did in this experiment, we changed uh, cloud albedo. Changing cloud albedo changes uh, top of atmosphere radiation budget. That means you're basically moving to a very different climate state. So this, for example, the Bjorkness compensation between ocean and the atmosphere doesn't work here anymore. And so you can actually have uh, an incre a different total AMOC and HEMOC. The details, how it works, uh, are a bit vague uh, at this moment. But because we, we are relaxing this top, top of atmosphere uh, constraint, uh, then we can have very different dynamics. Cool. Thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Does, do you have you looked at the effect of this on the periodicity of the interglacial periodicity? Um, well, we haven't looked from the, you know, point of view of uh, uh, modeling, but what I can tell you, uh, this spikes in carbon CO3, for instance, they are paced by obliquity cycles. So uh, high obliquity means PMOC, low obliquity means no PMOC. So uh, to, in simple terms, uh, PMOC uh, PMOC changes with glacial cycles. And with warmer periods, it looks like we have PMOC. With uh, colder periods, like the LGM, glacial maximum, we don't have PMOC. And that's consistent with this uh, discussion that I had. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much.